<laughs> Seriously, that's we should start with that. You were saying sleep's harder than diet. Yeah, in terms of helping people or getting people to change their behaviors to sleep well, it's I think it's way harder than than diet. What, to, makes, you, what makes you say that? I think there's a lot of um food is weird. People attach like values to food, like this is good, this is bad, this is sure. Yeah. But if you don't if people don't attach like quality sleep is good for me it's like impossible to get them to and it's like well but i love to be on my phone before bed i love to stay up late and watch a show like the thing that they do instead of sleep seems like it's always like this more valuable thing like yeah. i just don't want to go to bed yeah i just want to it's like oh man you're just killing yourself is it i mean the question though is it love or is it oh it's In just the... dopamine freaking it is. Um, and um, and that's um. one of the things that we used to hear all the time uh, at the gym when we would talk to people about sleep is, you know, we're like, that's like the only time that I get to myself at night to like, or with my yeah. significant other to sit down and we sit down and we watch a show and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I get that and wanting to relax. And, but like, are you doing it in such a, a way that you relax or do you start binge watching something and then look up and it's 12 30 and you got to be right. up at 6 30 and yeah you know. it's different if you do it for like 30 minutes or an hour and a half for two or three hours you know and i think, I think that, you can do that stuff like once a week or something if you want but like if that's your pattern every night as you stay up too late what do you expect i guess i, I think a lot of times it comes it comes down to uh you know, for example, the food value thing, you know, when people, I, I think a lot of that comes down to ignorance and they, and they, totally. and, and I don't mean it, not ignorance in a bad way, literally, like just literal ignorance, like they, they don't understand. Yeah, like for, for example, where you hear the, like donuts are bad, broccoli is good. And yeah. it's like to an extent you can, yeah, you could make that argument argument. It's probably better to eat some broccoli than it is to eat donuts, but when you when you zoom back out and you realize that the biggest thing that's going to affect your health is the amount of calories that you take in it's difficult to just ascribe a certain value to a food and say this is good and this is bad and in so doing and making that choice a lot of times when you say well i just made a bad choice you ascribe that value to yourself and you say well I'm a person that makes bad choices. And then it just kind of, it, it spirals from there. And then it does, it's not really helpful where it's like, if you have an understanding of like, Oh, well, I don't know. I'm making up numbers. You know, this donut is X calories and it has this much fat and this much carbs. Like, all right, well, I'm going to enjoy this donut. I just will balance everything out by making different choices by throughout the rest of the day. You know what I mean? Totally. Like for example, I, totally. I, uh, Last, I rarely drink anymore, but for some reason last night I was having some red meat and I wanted to have a little wine. And so I did. Don't you oh, back, fuck. We back just, to the wine. We're back yeah. on the wine. Yeah. You can judge me. I don't care. Um, <laughs> we, uh, so I had, I opened up, I just bought a cheap bottle from the grocery store. And I was like, well, I'll just have a little bit. And I had five ounces, like, which is one of the things that I think people mess up with wine is they give themselves uh, these gigantic glass. points. Yeah. Not a glass serving. A glass is five, a, a serving of wine is five ounces. And so I had five ounces of wine and then while I was making dinner and then like maybe two ounces while I had, had my steak. And so I just had a steak, I had a salad and then I didn't add any carbohydrates to that meal. Cause I was like, well, I'm getting, I'm supplanting those calories and that with the wine. So it's like, well, I know that the calorie balance isn't going to, the energy balance isn't going to work in my favor if I throw carbohydrates and stuff on top of this. So I just didn't have them. And I think it's having that kind of an understanding and, and not being emotional about it is, is really the, the farthest you get. And then just like, you know what I think a lot of times it is, man, when it comes to sleep it's like people can't break the the FOMO of being 22 to 25 years old. You know what I mean? Where they think there's still this value on that when, when you don't realize that like 
not the sleeping coolest. is shit. Well, and the coolest shit that you do in your life, you need a lot of energy for. Yeah. And that requires sleep. And it's not like catching up on this show or being, it's like, it's being able to go out and do the things that you want to do while you're awake. And then you get way more out of life from doing that than you do from, um, from staying up and also the chronic disease and everything that you perpetuate by not sleeping is just like your increased risk for cancer, for Alzheimer's, for all of these things go up by, by limiting your sleep. Yes. I mean, sleep is, I think sleep is a, if I were going to give a, um, the biggest factor predictive of how the next day is going to go for me. Um, not that if I just don't sleep well, like I'm going to have a shit day, but it's, that's the biggest one. Like you can eat not great the day before the next day. You're not going to be like feeling it, but sleep or booze or the two that are really going to fuck you over the next day. Yeah. Um, and booze fucks with your sleep. So it's a compound effect there. There's something that I, I think that we, I think Chris and I talked about this on the, the podcast for the gym, but I don't think we mentioned it here is to help people understand when you drink that your body cannot store alcohol it can't store it no so it's it, it's fucking it, poison literally yeah, and it, i say that i drink but it's it's poison it like, is poison but it, it, it can't your body can't convert it into fat for storage it can't convert it into glycogen for storage it blows right through everything so it has to burn it first and so mm-hmm. one of the reasons that weight gain comes on so much with drinking is not just the excess calories but like your body has to burn through that before it gets to the other things that you've consumed. And so now you have all of these excess calories in there that are going to get stored because your body's going to use the alcohol first. And so you look at your calorie intake and your calorie expenditure and how you're expending those calories. And it's just like the math doesn't add up. And that's also why it messes with your sleep so much. If you have it late in the evening and you don't metabolize it before you go to bed, like you see your heart rate go up. Um, and all these things, because that's your body trying to manap- metabolize the poison that it can't, it can't save, it can't store. So, um, yeah, I, I just think those little pieces of understanding, like, I think they help people when they, when it comes down to making that decision of like, oh, my body's going to have to use this before it can do anything else. And that's why my heart rate's elevated. That's why I can't sleep. That's why all these things are disrupted. So I just think those little pieces of understanding are very helpful. Yeah, and not to say, like I said, same. I'm not like anti anything um, entirely, other than if you're going to say like I'm going to do heroin or smoke or do other kind of white drugs or something, it's probably not a good idea. But <laughs> um, booger sugar, man. It, like you, uh, if you have an understanding to where you're like, ah, I'm going to have like a beer, you know, or whatever, but like three, three beers, not not so good. And everybody's different, but um you know that's kind of the the cutoff is really for for me and it'll still affect my sleep um but if i have like a drink or whatever on a friday i can be fine oh sure but if you have like two plus um that your sleep's fucked or just you're digging out of the hole the next day um and it kind of sucks not saying you can't do it once in a while but if you do that regularly that's the issue good that's not good it's just you have to ask yourself the question is it worth it man like is is it worth it to do these things and i mean if that's really how you want to depends on why people drink well you're also you're gonna you're gonna pay for it at some point oh yeah whether you you acknowledge it or not yeah you're gonna pay for it like old age is gonna be worse or you're just not gonna have as rich of a life as you could right now even in the immediate future though like you're still you still gotta pay the piper like the next day you gotta if you're like have a a workout or whatever and it's like yeah dude your heart rate's gonna be higher than it should be um all that shit or just anything like, it doesn't even have to be a workout like you're you're fuzzy you're in a haze like your shit doesn't work it's just like the same people you know going back to sleep at when we have people come in for consultations at the gym you know we talk about lifestyle factors and things like that the people that are really like getting four hours of sleep or so like they know they know that they're fucked up and they know that things are fucked mm-hmm. up and it's obvious to them. Right. And like, yes, I have to make a change because this isn't working. But then there's this spot where people are only getting five to six hours of sleep and they're like, 
oh no, I function just fine on five to six hours of sleep. And the truth is, is they just don't, they perceive that, but they don't have the awareness of you think you're functioning at a really high level on five to six hours of sleep, but you're not. That's just because you're not getting six and a half to eight hours of sleep, you know? And if you were getting in the the actual sweet spot of sleep, you would feel much, much, much different. And um, it's just almost like there's this awareness where you're just like just below, you're below the baseline. So you don't really feel it. And I think it's the same thing with, with, with alcohol where, whether it's being able to drop weight or being able to perform like, well, it doesn't really affect me. It's like, well, have you cut that? Have you cut that five drinks a week down down to two yet? And then like, tell me that you Um, don't feel a difference, you know? Well, and the thing is most things don't get better over time. If people, if you kind of drink too much or you don't sleep enough, if you don't change something, odds are that's not going to get better over time. Typically, no. those things get worse. Absolutely. And that's what you see with people that don't, well, I haven't slept well for years. I don't, you know, I've been, I always, you know, have this many drinks and it, it, it just incrementally slides up. And it's just kind of, it, it's it's not just, you're not on some trajectory where things will magically get better. I think that, I think there's a couple, like the other things that matter is, are why the person's having the drink. So I think the yeah. two most destructive things are habit, obviously, because it's just ingrained and then also coping. And I think that that's where people really get themselves into trouble. Whereas like, if you're like, man, you know what? I'd like to have a little wine with dinner tonight, or I'm going to have a gin and tonic, you know, with dinner tonight. And, you know, that's one thing, but to sit there and habitually just ingrain yourself into doing it, or just, you know, when you're stressed, like, boom, I'm going to run to the booze. And that's, those are the two ways that people yeah. really get themselves in trouble. That's a, that's a dark road. Even if Super you don't dark, have a problem, man. that's a, that's a dark fucking road. Super dark. It doesn't work out. So no, well, there was an impromptu session. Well, today we were going to talk about um, your conditioning. Cause you're kind of experimenting ahead with different things that um, because you went through Joel Jameson's course. So I'd like to talk a little bit about what you're doing and what you're finding. It's testing week right now. So we'll uh, talk a little bit about what's going on with that for the Backcountry Ready members that have been with us since the beginning of the year. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, the turkey hunt in California. So that's the plan for today. Let's um, Let's jump in with testing week. So... We test every 13 weeks, essentially. Well, it'll be a little bit longer over the summer, but throughout most of the year, um, it's just about every 13 weeks. And we do that at the end of each block to see, you know, what fitness we accumulated and then also to drive our decision-making and help our members drive their decision-making for the next training block. And so we test movement capacity, we test relative strength, we test muscular endurance, um, we test... Uh, aerobic, essentially aerobic power and and recovery. And then we do a a specific test, a a hunting specific test with a three mile ruck. Um, And so that gives us like, that gives us the broad spectrum of, of where people might need uh, that covers everything from, from a training perspective, foundationally that people would need for, to be, I mean, honestly ready for anything that you want to do. It's not necessarily just hunting specific, like those, I think really the only, I guess the only truly hunting specific tests that we do are the squat hold at the the 30 second squat hold, because you got to sit in the bottom and it's like, you're going to be in that position when you're camping or whatever, you know, and then the ruck assessment and everything else is just general human ability, which is the foundation yeah. that we build upon to be able to, to go out and hunt. Yeah, it's just general useful way to be a person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Human requirements of things that are going to serve anybody well. So, um, so far this week, we're it's Tuesday right now, and we have people's people's movement capacity. So we just went through our our off season training block, which is mostly capacity based. So building strength capacity through. Um, high intensity, continuous training, tempo strength and eustress training, and then like aerobic capacity training through a lot of, of rucking and, and low heart rate, uh, low heart rate work and mobility training. 
And so we're seeing, we're reaping the benefits of the strength training, which is interesting because we, we didn't focus on getting a ton stronger, but we have folks that, that got a ton stronger in these first few months. Um, and we're seeing the mobility improve, which is, I think one of the most important things because it gives us the foundation to really train for the rest of the year. So people's shoulder mobility is improving. We're seeing deadlift numbers go up by like 20 pounds in 12 weeks. People on a, push up on a five rep. On a five rep, exactly on right. Five, yeah. 20 pounds on a five rep. Right. Yeah, it's not a single rep. We're seeing serious gains on that. And I and I think that it's important to note that we do the five rep and not the max because, like, I think it's, it's more indicative of sustained relative strength. And it also keeps us using loads that aren't – that are important. Stupid. That yeah. aren't stupid. That are that – are, <laughs> <laughs> that we can demonstrate the quality <laughs> without putting so much weight on the bar that we're going to try to shit our spine, you know? So, um, I was, I was so happy to start seeing, I would like, as things were coming in yesterday morning, I was looking at the test measures from this time. And then I was going back to the beginning of January and looking at people and I was like, Holy shit. Yeah, this is awesome. I mean, of course you expect people to get better and you want them to and everything like that, but like actually seeing it is, is, is really it cool. So. Yeah, I mean, because there's a lot that can go sideways in oh yeah thirteen and weeks like, and there's so little that we have control over as totally you know, running an online program. It's like people are left to their own devices. I mean, even yeah. at our gym, it's the same. It's the same thing. Yeah. But like to see it is really awesome. Yeah, dude. I, I mean, and then Rush, he got sixty one push ups in a minute. Yeah, badass, dude. So that's that's really good. That's yeah. hauling. It is. I mean, Bo got fifty three which is I think the next best number that came in yesterday. Maybe somebody else got more. I'd have to look back at the numbers. So um, it was so good though. A push up a, a second is, is fast for that sustain for sustaining it for that yeah, long. Absolutely. It's fast. Yeah. yeah. Which is awesome. So, so we still have 12 minute step up test. That's today, um, which is going to measure aerobic power. So how, how long can you sustain a, a high rate of work? at higher heart rates and then how quickly can you recover from that work um and we'll do that today and then we still have our squat and chin up and and rock assessments later in the week so um yeah i'm excited because we're going into a strength and aerobic power phase um coming up so to see that we're getting the numbers that we are out of out of what we did during the first three months of the year is is, is awesome i'm excited about it I am too. It's the, this is probably my favorite time of year. Um, because people have done like the strength work in the winter and then capacity work now. And then it's kind of like time to, time to turn it up a little bit for the spring. And that's really, I think the, my favorite, favorite time just to see people because they kind of can express a lot of strength or speed or power or whatever. And it's, yeah, it's really awesome to see. It is awesome. And it's, it, this is, I mean, there's a lot about the summer that is challenging from a training perspective. It's, it's the summer preseason training block is not easy, but this next one is, is a, probably a little bit more challenging. And, um, I just, this is the time when we really build the engine that allows us to do the things that we want to do in the summer. So we have the raw materials. Now we, we, teach our body to use those raw materials even better. And then we go out in the summer and get a little miss, a little bit more specific with things. And then we all ship off for a couple weeks to a month and do our hunts and then get back into it and make sure we're good the whole way through hunting season. And we keep rolling through the cycle, but it's, uh, I don't know. I just, I, I, I've been, I've been, uh, a strength and conditioning coach for 17 years and it just still, it just never gets old to see no. people get results. It just doesn't get old. So it's really cool. It's been a cool week so far. Yeah. I can't say I've been doing anything probably for 17 years other than breathing. Um, <laughs> I've been doing that pretty adequately, but I don't think just in general, like human performance gets old. It's why sports are popular. Yeah. You name it. Like human performance is, is cool. And then seeing air quotes, regular people, really do good stuff and meet some of their goals and stuff is, is really awesome. 
Yeah, that's super cool. And you just because it's especially because like the things that we work on, yes, this is a hunting training program and, and the way that things are designed, it will improve your performance in the backcountry. But really, this is this is like life and activity sustainable yeah. training, you know? Absolutely. Like it's this is what's gonna keep you doing shit when when you're 80 and everybody else is talking about what they used to be able to do. And now you're, you're still out doing the shit and enjoying your life, you know? So that's the goal. Yeah. I don't think anybody is going to say like, nah, I don't really want to be stronger. I really don't want to be in better aerobic shape. I don't, you know, I don't want to be more flexible. Nobody's going to say that. I don't think. Yeah. If they are, they're just afraid of something they don't really want to address. I think that's really it. I'll tell you what, I, I think what's going to do us a big favor too, especially from a broad scale perspective, like all the things that we've been talking about so far, you know, from the sleep and the alcohol consumption to training and testing and all the things we're talking about. Peter Atia's new book, man, if like enough people read that, it's going to be an act on the information. It's really going to change the way that people approach lifestyle. I don't know if you've looked at it at all yet, but I, I'm, ha- I'm like, I haven't, I haven't yet, but um, I obviously like Peter Atia. There's some things that I'd um, I don't know. They're they're fitness wise, but I think his message regarding health overall is like, I wish I wish that medicine in the U.S. had his approach. I that, really I, do. I hope that this is the 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 foundational piece that starts to change that. I really do. I, I hope. I that, really, like... I really wish like his stuff is just. I mean, uh, per- did I tell you I went to the doctor? I have a perfect example for you. Yeah, I'd like to hear it. No, you didn't tell me, but Uh, I went to the doctor just because, you know, like just to go to the doctor, nothing, get my labs, whatever. And they're like, okay, why are you here? And I was like, just to, you know, to know stuff, annual visit, (laughs) like just, you know, and they kind of look at you like, well, why are you here? But if you don't have a doctor, they're like, why don't you have a doctor? Uh, you know, so you're like, well, I have a doctor just like in case, uh, you know, whatever, like just check my labs. And so they're like, well, you're young, you're healthy. Um, so we don't really need to do any labs. And um, yeah, you don't have any symptoms or anything. And I was like, well, I would like to get my labs checked. And she's like, well, you can. And I was like, I kind of want to get some uh cholesterol stuff done and i asked for some specific labs and she's like why do you want that i was like well statistically i'm most likely to die from cardiovascular disease um, if like everything goes right and i have a normal lifespan so i think waiting until i have symptoms for any of that stuff seems kind of counterintuitive because then i can't really change anything at that point and she's like okay so what labs do you want ordered yeah. <laughs> like, just let me pick off the menu because it's like so I you wait till you have symptoms, like just be reactive. And to be fair, that's how a lot of people treat their health. They think everything is fine until it's not. Oh, absolutely. It's not a, it, my labs and everything are okay. So I'm healthy. They don't look at it that way. It's like you're, you're on your way to being unhealthy or sick. Not, I want to stay as healthy as I possibly oh, sure. can early. And that's his approach. It's literally flip flop from the yep. way things are done today. Yeah. Well, atherosclerosis doesn't happen in six months. You know what I mean? Like, no, you were building that shit over 20 years, dude. Yeah. You know, like you should be able to, (laughs) like, well, I mean, if somebody comes to you and is like, Hey, I want to know my risk and I want to modify my behaviors, uh, starting really early so I can, you know, I've never had a problem before my labs previously been good, but I still don't want to either. I want to. Yeah. And they're like, well, why do you want to do that? And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? You know, like, yeah. uh, well, that's also an, a, and it's a, a point that he makes in the book is like, and, and you look at these numbers and I guess you kind of, you got to have the education or, or learn enough to be able to read between the lines because, you know, they give you the averages, right. And oh, it's okay. Cause you're, you're on the average, but like average right now skews towards un, unhealthy, you know, and just because it's average doesn't mean it's like a good number or an optimal number. Like it still could be something that you need to address. So I think that that's an, an important point too, is just seeking the education or at least the, the medical 
help or medical staff to be able to look at that and say, yeah, like it's, it says it's average, but man, you probably still need to pay attention to that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially like he's, you know, with April B is that kind of thing, but saying yeah. like the lab value says like is good, but it's really, if you're like in the good quote range, it's still like the range is made off of people that are very high risk for disease also. Yeah. You know what I mean? The range yeah. isn't for like healthy people. You know what the crazy part about that is too? The, there was a study done called the interheart study. And um, that like apolipoprotein ratio is one of the biggest predictors of cardiovascular disease, along with smoking, diabetes, all the normal shit. Yeah. It's, it was done 20 years ago. It was like, you know, 52 countries, something like that. Like, they've been there's been studies on stuff like that for a long time but just like american heart and stuff has just not embraced it just for what reason i have no idea this doesn't make sense it's not like he's not talking about anything like like new and out there like no. he's talking about stuff with his shit pile of data behind it, it. yeah and it's just like it's decades. making making a mindset shift towards <laughs> like understanding that uh, but man uh, but uh, but yeah. Anyway, so I just I think a lot it would help a lot of people to read that book. Um, I I agree. And <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just your experience with um. Why do you want this? I just don't understand. And like yeah. I'm like probably the worst person to get on the end of that. And it's like because I hate you know I never say what I do or anything. They always ask like, "What do you do for work? Are you in school?" And I'm like no not in fucking school you know like yes i work i'm 35 years old i hope i work you know unless i have a trust fund in that case i would not work that's, <laughs> that's fair, fucking fair fine enough. and if but if i did i wouldn't be here in this strip mall at a doctor i'd be coming to my house okay <laughs> uh so yeah they kind of they kind of like give you some attitude and then same thing i was like I told the doc I work with, I was like, just you watch my creatinine is going to be high and she's going to be like, oh, we need to recheck your creatinine. And I'm like, fuck. Sure enough. They're like, well, this lab was a little high, but your other kidney function looked fine. And, uh, and I'm like, no, we don't need to recheck it. It's okay. It's fine. Yeah. It's just unreal. Everything is geared toward people being sick, not being healthy. And it's like it's just and you don't want to be an asshole you know to people like well my creatinine is high but creatinine isn't always actually an indicator of kidney function kidney they function. can give you a gfr based off of your creatinine which works for a lot of the population and a lot of the population is really not healthy so it works but you would be better off to look at like a cystatin c or something like that which actually showed it was aside from how much lean mass you have because they've studied the shit out of that too and basically how much exercise and lean mass and stuff will impact your creatinine total side tangent no it's good it's good information i think that because i mean a lot of people you go to the doctors and they'll hear this stuff and be like well they said my kidneys aren't working right so i got to do this and this and that because this one elevated measure that's taken out of context yeah, you know yeah yeah oh you're eating too much protein you're doing this and yeah. it's like yeah but all my other kidney waste products are or you know i say that with quotations because they're not all necessarily but like oh your bun's normal all this other stuff's normal why is that and like i think it's just a transient high that's what they say and they're like no it's not I actually predicted that this would happen a week ago with another person that I work with. And sure enough, you did exactly what I thought you would. <laughs> <laughs> it's just annoying, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the good thing is, though, is that you have enough knowledge and the context to be able to to not to put those things in their place, whereas most people don't don't understand. So they they have to take that stuff at face value. And. And. Uh, that's that's where they start making decisions that might not necessarily be the best decisions for them. You know, you really, you really could be led in a, in a, not a good direction. But then think about were... that. What that is too, is like, then you start to have this belief, which pervades everything that is going to affect how you approach everything else in your life. Like I'm not healthy or there's something wrong with me, you know, when in, in actuality there might not be. 
Yeah. It's, it is highly possible. And even just then that mindset, uh, I've talked with one of my friends, you know, about them getting their labs done and stuff and them, you know, like, man, you get labeled with this or whatever. And it's just, it can be kind of destructive that, that mindset in general, but at the same time, also, are there a lot of good laboratory values you can get that are pretty run of the mill that are good indicators? For sure. Yeah. Um, and are, is it good to have that benchmark to drive some behavior change if needed? Absolutely. Absolutely. But Absolutely. you have to. And that's why I think people need to be informed consumers, man. Like, especially with your healthcare, whether you realize it or not, like you're a consumer. Mm -hmm. Um and so, like you're saying, Peter Atia, not not saying like that's the gospel, but no, um, no, but I it's, think it's very, very good and a fantastic step in the right direction. Absolutely, and it, the mindset, the mindset shift that it could create is really the the biggest value, which is, is well, awesome. You know? Yeah, because that, that's I think a lot of people, and because they're not informed consumers, like you, you have to take things at face value. But then, and like, and maybe this is maybe this is the wrong mindset and, and I'd be willing to hear you correct me if you think it's incorrect, but like a doctor, a nurse practitioner, a PA, a nurse, whoever it is there. I relegate them to the role of consultant. Like here, here is the information. And then the decision is up to me, you know? And I think yeah. most people go with that. Like they steep these people with too much authority and then, because of that they end up because i just see it with my like with uh i've seen it with my mother and her health and things like that because um she just takes what her doctor says at face value all the time and doesn't have enough questions to be able, like well maybe we could approach this differently yeah. and so you know i think it's i think it's more complicated than that your mom's from a different generation one um which they're just like doctor says gotta yeah. do it um uh, granted the younger generations are not so much like that and more of like the consultant kind of thing but at the same time like also people don't ever fucking listen to doctors that when they're like oh you need to like watch your blood pressure um here's some things you can do you should really um we should really try to get your a1c down because you're headed toward having diet like doctors say this stuff all the time too it just falls on deaf ears and give people resources and stuff and people just don't fucking do it. And then they get to a point where shit's out of control and they show up and the doctor's like, well, yeah, I mean, like we really should start your own blood pressure meds, a statin and something for your diabetes, because if this continues, you haven't changed anything. Everything's getting worse. This would be good to do. And then you get that like cycle where the person is like, <laughs> they treat the doctor kind of as a consultant, meaning like they don't listen to shit they say. But then once everything falls apart, they come in and are like, all right, so you need to fix me. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, you know, I'm, like, I'm totally getting what you're saying, man. But but I, I agree with you in terms of like people our age. I really think you should be well informed and you should like, like I said, you kind of you go to the doctor just if you need to, but proceed with caution with some things and like you said, you know, kind of they should and really a good physician, like some that I work with, like they want to collaborate with people on their health. They don't want to tell them what to do. Like right. good physician. They're like, hey, here's what we can do. I want to help you. But like, I can't do the shit for you. You know, we, we should it should be a two way back and forth, like right. kind of relationship. But you do have a lot of people that are like, well. I'm the doctor. I don't know what that is, so I'm not going to fucking order it. Yeah. I mean, and and um, and and also kind of from that perspective, fair enough, because we live in such a litigious society that it's like, yeah, you know, why wouldn't you just follow the paradigm and and not go from it? Because you know that well, and whether your consciousness of it or not is like this gets me paid. This is mostly safe. This is what I understand. Like. So I'm mm -hmm. just going to do this thing, you know, so fair enough. But yeah, standards, standards are standards. And sometimes it's not necessarily the, the it's some like some of the standards need to change, I think. And for physicians to be doing, you know, to be operating the same thing, quote, safely or within guidelines, like some of the guidelines and stuff need to change too. 
Yeah. It's just, it's a huge shit snare to use a trailer park boys term <laughs> of problem. <laughs> it uh, is a shit snare. It's a fucking shit snare. Yeah. Shit hawks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. All right. Well, we should we should probably move on. So uh your conditioning. You've been so you did the the Joel Jameson, one of his like free courses, and you've been kind of following one of the paradigms, uh one of the the prescriptions in there. You've been doing what the it's called the one, two, three prescription. Uh yeah. Template. Yeah. C. It's basically uh like uh if you're familiar with Morpheus, it's like a, a green day, a blue day, a green day, a red day, two blue days. Um, just varying intensity. So it's just a little more um, intensity than um, what I'm normally doing at this time of year. But that's partially because I'm in better shape this time of year than I normally am. So I could just because I did a ton of volume of hiking with the dog um so i was in a place where i could do a little i could increase the intensity a little bit yeah um as compared to years past so um i don't know i well I walk actually... me through the days like what what is what have your green days looked like so green would be to give people context that would be this is an oversimplification, but I'm, it's going to be the best way to understand it is like kind of an aerobic power type training. So like that's, yeah, yeah, mostly what the green days are going to be like. Blue is like a aerobic capacity type training day, like cardiac output zone two slash zone three type day. And then uh, red is a max heart rate day. So most of the time on that, you're what? Why did you smile? Red, red fucking sucks. Oh yeah. It's like a, so it's, it's like a lactic power or a lactic capacity type training day. So where you're getting your heart rate up above 90% of your heart rate max. Yeah. So for the the green or the kind of aerobic power days, I've been doing um, the thresholds, basically. Um, How long have you been holding the, the intervals for? Um, right now, let me look at my last. Uh... Um, right now I'm at five minutes. Okay. Yeah. It's about where we typically do them for backcountry ready. Yeah. So I'm at five minutes, um, for those. And then, um, you're doing that similar setup twice per week. Um, I'm doing one threshold day and then I'm doing one, um, the, a power interval, which I'm doing sprints for those. Okay. So 10 seconds. Like sprint. running sprints or on your bike? Running. Oh, speedy. Running sprints. 10 seconds uh, sprint, 60 second rest. Um, you know, repeated uh, like three or four times, then with a bit of rest and repeat, you know, um, until, you know, rest until your heart rate recovers to whatever target you set. But for me, basically it's, uh, I'll do, uh, like four of those intervals and then I'll have, um, a walk for like four to six minutes and then repeat that and usually do that like twice. Um, and then for the Rojo days, it's just, the the good old assault bike, uh, for, the 20 to well right now 30 second max sprint uh two minutes rest yeah so that's like a that's like a lactic power interval mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's it nothing too too fancy and then what crazy. are you doing on your blue days you just uh on my blue days um i i still i mean i ride the shit out of the assault bike this okay i would like to be outside more but it's still snowing here and still sucks so <laughs> literally dude it snowed yesterday again um so but i've just been riding the assault bike a lot fair enough tune tune low play slow yeah that's so. the dude the it's i have this tendency with the assault bike where it's like i use it a lot for 
for low heart rate conditioning. But a lot of times it's just so hard because I just want to get on that thing. And I have like for years and years have myself trained, like we get on here and we burn and then we get off. And so it's like, there's this part of my brain that's like, I can't, I don't want to sit on this thing for a long time. Like that sucks. Oh yeah. You know? And so it's like, it's actually a little uh, like mental skills exercise for me to do a long duration ride on the, on the assault bike, you know, it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't like I don't to do it, it that way. Yeah. I don't, my Quinn says the same thing. My wife, she hates it. She hates being on it for any period of time. So we yeah. yeah, have to keep her like getting on and off the bike for her to be happy about using it. I understand that. I understand yeah. that. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think, I don't think that's uncommon. I just, for me, it's just like, I need to do this. I don't want to go outside right now because it's wind chill. It's 15 degrees and there's snow and ice. And oh, so sure. I'm going to well, sit here and do this. It's easy for easier in that case, because your options are limited. You know, it's nice yeah. here. I can go outside and, and walk Yo, for two hours. If I yeah. If you could go so. outside and do something for sure, do it. Um, yeah. It's been nice. The days that it has been, has been better outside to get out and run at the track because just literally even if it's i mean it's been cold but just getting outside like especially in the morning on a on a weekend or whatever is is so awesome yeah man you, even if it's 20 degrees like i would prefer to be outside oh absolutely absolutely but you've seen so you've seen some how long have you been doing that for six weeks is what you said mm-hmm. that protocol and so what have you seen results wise um i've basically just been watching my hrv i mean obviously if my recovery scores and stuff went down or got worse i I would change something but my recovery is usually pretty good um and so my hrv average has gone up two points my av my total average so it's good um uh, my average typically i was gonna say you typically have a high hrv to start with yeah so it's kind of hard to i didn't even know if it would change anything just because like i don't know if i'm as high as it's going to get i think i'm probably getting kind of close to where unless i do a lot of even then it's just it's up there so yeah i'm at an average of 92 and my resting heart rate has actually come down a little bit um typically i was in the mid to upper 40s and now i'm in the pretty much always under 45 in the morning somewhere in there 42 to 44 that's a big that's a big gain yeah yeah it's i mean i think so it doesn't sound like it but it is i mean an average an average drop in your resting heart rate like that is like very indicative yeah. of, of in fitness improvement yeah i think so too um what uh so the one two three protocol that you saw the one red day two green days three blue days did he say what fitness level he typically prescribes something like that for he says most people he would keep on that. Most people he wouldn't go more intensity than that because they can't recover from it. Is there a, is there a level before that though? That's not I for for him that's kind of what he that's what he does. Yeah, because um I think it's with the intent that like um like if I mean, it sounds kind of stupid, but if most people are like heart rate training and stuff, they're probably not grossly untrained. I would be, I would assume most people that are kind of oh, like sure, sure. doing that are probably somewhat there, but I know there's some studies and stuff to show that getting your, like getting uh, close to a max heart rate, not for any kind of duration at all, um, but short, like once a week or so is generally beneficial for people um i think most people just overdo it to where they either are there too long or what i see people want to do a lot is where they're in that no man's land they're not at a max intensity place he talks about that a lot too with people like you're not actually training at 100 percent intensity you know they're doing repeats or something and their speed or whatever drops way off and Cal Dietz would talk about that too. Yeah. Like, run, you know, if he was doing sprints or something, he's like, the minute your speed drops off, like you're Stop. done, yeah. you're done. And I don't think people have that, um, 
understanding. So you have people like droning on and on and they're like, yeah, my heart rate's in the red. I'm like, yeah, but you're also at 60% of your original pace. Like, yeah, you're not getting what you need from that. Yeah. It was time to turn it off a long time ago. Yeah. So, I mean, unless you're training for lactic capacity where you like need to be in that place for a longer time for, but you're going to see performance drop, but like, it's so rare that you need to do that. So rare. I Yeah. I was going to say for what I yeah. want to do, I can't see why I would do it's, that. But. It's got to be like a, like a combat sport. I can maybe see, I mean, I've used it with people on sheep hunts and I could see a justification for that, but I don't think it's really, I think if you're going to do lactic work, like lactic power is fine because, um, all of your aerobic power work and your, and your aerobic capacity work is going to take care of everything else that you need. I was going to say, I kind of more just count on the, the other stuff to, to carry me along because it seems like for what I do that those are kind of the the places that I'm going to be. And, but really first and foremost is like getting that blue zone window as high as you can absolutely, oh, absolutely. get it. Absolutely. That's like, that's public enemy number one to where you're, you know, you're not in that aerobic power zone until you're at a heart rate of like 155. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you got some serious bandwidth to, but the, to but cruise. That's not, and but that's not just training though, either, you know, and that goes back to things that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast of oh, absolutely. your sleep, your recovery, like your hydration, you know, all of those things, like when you're over, is down, over, that's, that's the shit that's going to keep you able to, to do that. So it's not just a training thing, but yeah. I'm just always, I, I love, I love Joel. Obviously we do a lot of what we do is based on his influence. And I think I did the BioForce uh, conditioning certification in like 2015 or something like that. And so I'm just always interested to see how he grows and adapts and how he applies things. And um, yeah, it, it's just, we phase things out a little bit differently during the year. Like we don't always hit that intensity in the yeah. same way with our conditioning. But if you look at our our capacity work during this past phase like you would get some of the green work from high intensity continuous training or from you know some of the tempo training like it's not necessarily the traditional way that you would do it but if you look at how things playing out like you still kind of get those things too and, and not just a direct traditional concerted uh conditioning effort you know yeah 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 i think uh it, it also comes down to like you have so many eggs put in these baskets and you need these different attributes. Uh, you can't necessarily just say like everybody do everything because yeah. they're not going to be able to recover from it. So you exactly kind of have right. to pick and choose what you're going to do. It just me personally, I'm in a little bit of a, you're, you're different you're, spot. You're, you're a very fit dude, which helps a ton. But I mean, we also have to like, from our perspective, which I, I told you the other day when we were texting, like a lot of the next training block will look a lot like the one pretty much that yeah. it's like that but like we also have to look at um the different aspects like where we do get specific with with hunting fitness and like what does that put us from a movement standpoint like what are we doing um and how does that play into these different designations as well like that's also something that has to be factored in for us so but yeah, that's a really the, good template there there's a lot to be factored in and i think Honestly, like the conditioning schedule is probably the easiest piece. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Easy, yeah. It's the easiest part, like, uh, because that stuff's like relatively well established. So it's having all of the other ducks in a row that is, I think, much harder. I think, and I think one of the things to drive home from what you just said is you, and, and what I just said about you is like, you are a fit guy, very good aerobic fitness, like, strong all those things you do you've done one red day one and, mm-hmm. and you could it. and you could likely recover from two but it's like looking at minimal effective dose and then like most people are going to have a hard time recovering from that one red day and they're going to see a curve where maybe their HRV drops, maybe their recovery drops, and they're going to see that for a number of weeks before they actually gain the fitness to to deal with that. And so if you're looking at programs where you have 
multiple days, two to three days where you're redlining, like it's just going to fuck you up. Like you're not going to be able to deal with it and it's not going to put you in the best place fitness wise. And and we're talking just conditioning. We're not talking with lifting and with everything, and everything else. else on top. Of and, it, yeah. and then life on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. that's another thing to keep in mind, you know, especially is when it comes to training and like, we we put this designation of hunter on ourselves and yes we train for hunting the the bulk of what we do is to make sure that we're able to go do the things that we love and do them for as long as possible but you also like that's such in the grand scheme of things it's it's a, a pretty small percentage of your life you know yes pretty small percentage it's very I, small. I guess i shouldn't say it depends like i don't know i probably i realistically hunt or fish between 70 and hundred days a year, but I'm like a single guy that, that has a dog and a girlfriend. Like I don't really have to, and I, but I do run some businesses and everything, but like it's still in the grand scheme of things, all these other things are more important, you know? And so I think it's keeping that in mind when you look at some of these programs that are going to demand so much of you, it's like, well, how is that going to affect you as a dad? Or like, can you actually take and put these things can you put all the energy you need to into all of these different things to be able to get what you want out of them? And, and most of the time, the answer is no, if you have a training program, that's way too intense. Yeah. I, I also think like having a training program that asks a certain amount of you to where you would miss out on other things is like telling Silly. of, yeah, it's very <laughs> telling of the people who wrote it because this needs to be like something you can do over and granted you can get to a very high level of fit. What I would consider like a high level of fitness and have it not like rule your world. It's like just getting a workout in for the day. And a lot of people are like, well, you just check in a box or showing up. And it's like, that's 99% kind of, of it, dude, dude. I I'm kind of like tired of hearing people say that because it's like, you don't have to train with like maximal intensity to get to a place where you're really Absolutely good. Like, not like not to and and i think i'm like a relatively average person in terms of genetic disposition like i'm not super strong i'm not big whatever but it's like i'm in a place where i'm happy with how things are and i'm not like killing myself to do it well oh, dude yeah yeah and you're not you're not missing out on you know life stuff to do it and but, you know at the same time it's important you want to be healthy because you want to live a long life but you don't want it to be like all you do every day. You're boring too. That's oh, who you are. Dude. I mean, I, I'm not going to say 99%, but like 85 to 90% of building fitness and maintaining it is just making sure you check, show up and check the box every day for years on for end. years. That's really it. Because yeah. I, I can give you a pertinent example of, of it, of fitness taking away from the rest of your life. And I'll use Chris as an example. Like Chris just ran uh, the Georgia death race. I saw and, that. And he did really, really well. Like he finished ahead of his goal. And, you know, if there were some other things that he could have finished even faster, but the past eight months of his life, like he hasn't been able to do all of the other things that he loves. And he hasn't had the same amount of time for his family. He hasn't had, he didn't, he didn't hunt with me once this year. You know, he didn't, he typically fishes all fall and does all these things, but it's like, here's this one very, uh, specific thing that just sucks up all your time and energy. And I think sometimes it's good to go through crucibles like that and really test ourselves and, and show our commitment. But like, he was also so relieved that he doesn't have to approach life like that anymore when he was done with it, you know? And I think there are I, people that want to continue to approach life like that. And there's nothing wrong with that at all, but I don't think that's the majority of people. And I think that that's a value that they kind of interject from these people that are like that. And it's like, you don't have to be like that. Like you are not, what you do is not less valuable because you're not trying to run ultra marathons all the time. And you're not so hyper-focused on one thing, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I think Chris is badass because to do an ultra and him not, I don't, he didn't strike me as somebody that's ran a ton. And no. I could totally be wrong. No, you're not wrong. So he seems like somebody that went and like, started running and trained successfully and consistently enough to run an ultra in a very short period of time. And I've never done anything near that. I have ran a whole lot in my life 
And the reason why running fucking sucks is because the time commitment for running is any kind of distance is massive because you just have to have that time on your feet. And compared to any other training, in my opinion, like it takes a fucking enormous other than if you're like a cyclist or something, but same thing, those ultra endurance things, it's just time. And yeah. it's like so fucking much of it. And so for the people who have to train successfully for that, fuck, dude, they're like very. Goal-oriented. There's something to be admired for sure. Absolutely. I yeah, think you have to be, be immensely goal oriented to train with that frequency and duration for the for the period of time. It's just it's nuts. So uh, I think just what comes into it is a, a measure of self-awareness where you have to stop and say, am I really that person or am I? taking on a value that isn't really mine based on something that seems like it's something I should be doing. And and I think that that's where people have to stop themselves. And then you can really start to look at, you know, is this thing something I want to do? I think we should challenge ourselves pretty consistently. I think there's, but challenges don't have to be something that murder you though, either, you know? So I think ultra running too is one of those things that people kind of, that's a label they take on pretty like, Oh, I'm an ultra runner. And oh, cause yeah, you kind of, absolutely like, that's like your lifestyle. If you're going to do that. And yeah. other than like, I ran an ultra marathon once sweet. Oh but, dude. And the thing is, is like, if you have your life set up for that, like your partner, like go your for life, yeah. like do it, man. Like, no, I think it's badass when people can do stuff like that. But my thing is, is just, looking at your fitness program, the rest of your life, what you want to do, what do you really enjoy doing and and where do all of these circles cross? And, and that's where it's trying to be smart. And for most people, you know, for health, for longevity, for even for peak fitness, you don't need a ton of training intensity. You need training consistency more than anything else. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I agree. So, to all right real quick let's talk uh you know this i i didn't um i didn't kill a turkey in california this year first year yeah dude they just were weird like they didn't do anything like they normally did and i think i mean no surprise the crazy weather that you guys have been having out west like has messed those birds up and i don't doubt that for one second Dude, it was, I had, I had birds yo-yo twice. And so like, I know you don't know turkey hitting super well, but like a turkey, it'll come to your call and then it'll start to walk away and it'll come back and it'll start to walk away. And I had birds do that twice. Couldn't get them to finish. And, and you're talking on a big ranch where they're unbothered creatures. Yes. Like, yeah. They're, they're not this isn't public land super high pressure like these are these are mostly unfucked with birds there used to be this idiot that would come and just chase them around but even in years past like when he did that it it wasn't a big deal we could we could call them in and get on them it's like they just they just were so weird this year and uh none of the things that we could count on happening like so for example um in the morning there were these one birds that that would roost in this big pine and we had a pretty dialed in set of behaviors that like, okay, we can count on them doing one of these three things and we could, we can get in on them. And then, uh, Oh no, we've lost Jordan. He's, he's doing something. Took his headphones off. He doesn't want to hear what I have to say. I think it's, which is some bullshit. Oh, there he is. I'm back. Sorry, my computer was about to die. It was plugged into my laptop, but not the wall. So, you oh, know, you're going to want to do that part. So, but what I was saying is like, there's this set of birds that like one of three things are going to happen and they didn't do any of those damn things. And then there was this, what we call the back 40. They have this back pasture. It's pretty big. And there's a, there's a big hill that overlooks it. And so if you didn't get on birds in the morning, you could typically count on birds coming to this pasture in the afternoon and being able to be kind of aggressive and get on them. And they never came to the pasture either. So it was like, man, I think if I'd have had a a week, I probably could have figured it out. But like three days of hunting, man, I just, I just couldn't figure out what to do. There were times when I think I maybe should have been a little bit more aggressive and, and went at the birds. Um, 
because there's the topography there to kind of move and, and not get busted. But, uh, it was just a, it was a tough hunt. It was a lot of fun though, but that, <laughs> so the, the first morning, uh, we were set up on the birds that, that roosted in the pine tree and we're, it's 20 minutes to shooting light. And I remember this specifically because I was, I was sitting right beside Leanne and I said, it's 20 minutes till we can shoot. And so birds are starting to gobble. The ducks are making them ducks are quacking and kind of shock gobbling them and stuff. And then we see a, a car coming down the, the County road. And there's this guy that has had permission there, but he's been told like, I don't know, three years in a row, four years. In, we hunt on opening weekend. You can't come on opening weekend and all the, and so he, we see this car coming down the road and I go, who's that? And we see him park and we're like, fuck, we know who it is. So right as the birds are getting ready to fly down, this guy pulls up, flashes his headlights in the tree that all the birds are roosted in, <laughs> like parks right across the street, Clark Griswold. And just, so Leanne runs out and talks to him and it was just total buffoonery. Don't need, but anyway, the, so the birds fly down in the opposite direction, which of course makes sense. And so my plan is like, okay, well, they're typically going to stay high and walk out this, this kind of ridge line. I was like, well, we can swing around them and get up on top and, and move on them. And, uh, but then I, I didn't, we didn't know whether or not this guy got out of his truck. And so finally, like, so we just sat there and waited and finally we see him get out of his truck and then get back in and then drive off. And so like, cause I didn't feel safe cause this guy is like a buffoon. Like he literally runs and he like chases the turkeys. Like that's what he does. And so I was like, Leanne, I am not going to go walking up there and not have an idea where he is. Because well, that guy's out running around. Yeah. Not safe. So, um, there are lots of comedies and things like that going on, but it's, it was fun, but just, no turkey this year, but uh, season opens here on Saturday, and I will be out at my normal farm, hopefully shooting a turkey in the face. So I'm sure you will. We'll see how it shakes out. But yeah, that's my California story for this year. Yeah, it was green. Looked right. Dude, green. it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. So was much gorgeous. water. And we got to go up to Yosemite, which we didn't think we were going to be able to do. So yeah. I love it up there, dude. I love it up there. I think that's very cool. It is cool. It's super cool. And we went to the Iron Door Saloon, which is apparently the oldest saloon in California. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's a cool spot. Where's that at? Just outside of the park. And it starts with a G. God damn. What's the town called? It's on 120. It's on Route 120. Um, hmm. That was cool. Cool spot. So that's that. Well, we got to wrap this up. Hey guys, I'm I'm putting uh, links in our show notes for the free Facebook group and for all of our other free resources. So make sure you check that out. We just released in the Facebook group a uh, our newest ebook, Heart Rate Training for Hunters. So it walks through a lot of what Jordan and I talked about today with his conditioning, um, how to approach that, the science behind it, and then also um, some sample workouts if you want to check those out. So. Um, click any of those links, get yourself in. And, uh, as always, if you have any questions, shoot them over to us, Jordan, you are uh, a lovely man. And uh, likewise, sir, you're just saying that. Cause I said it. All right. 